Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up to Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. If you'd like to stand with us as we read Acts chapter 20, we'll begin in verse number 17. Most of you are familiar with this portion of Scripture. This is when Paul has uh, set his mind to go to Jerusalem, and he's actually headed in that direction. And you'll notice he comes to Ephesus here, and then he has a conversation with the elders here at the church. Acts chapter, se- Acts chapter 20, verse number 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Verse 24 is my text. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I want to preach out of verse number 24 mainly, and my subject is staying on course. Staying on course. Brother Joe Garrison, pray for us, please. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> like I said, Paul here is passionately progressing toward Jerusalem. He has got his mind set on going there because he said, like he did in Romans, it's his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. And don't forget, when God called him, he called him also to be a minister to the Jews, to his people, but also to the Gentiles. So Paul does have a burden for the Jews, although God has told him time and time again, When you get to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested, and this is not going to go well. And he's not listening to God trying to steer him. And what happens to Paul is he winds up in jail, and he spends the remainder of several years there in prison. I believe he's loosed. He's let out for a few years before he goes back. I believe there's a great case in the New Testament for two imprisonments of Paul. But nonetheless here, he's in a situation where... He very well thinks that he might die, and he's headed for Jerusalem. So here at Ephesus, he gets with the elders of the church, and he gives them a few last words of encouragement. We don't have time to read the rest of the chapter. But he gives some personal words here in verses 23 and 24. He basically says, look, I know that everybody's telling me this isn't going to go well, and that they're going to arrest me, they're going to kill me, or whatever. He goes, but I'm not worried about it. That's not going to bother me. And I really like what he says in verse number 24, so that I might finish my course with joy. And so the idea that I want to draw from this is the idea of staying on course in your Christian life. If there ever was a time in our society today to get you off course, I think it's now. I mean, there's all kind of stuff going on. And it's going on from this direction, then you think, okay, now something's beginning to settle here. Then something else crazy begins to rise up. And then you have all these things coming around. And I believe the devil, what he wants to do is, always, not just during these times, but especially now, is get our focus and our attention off of Jesus Christ and off of eternity. You know, they have that phrase, keep the main thing the main thing. And you know, it's so hard to do that. 
But I think as, as Bible believers, we really need to get back in tune. If there was one thing I would say is wrong with Bible-believing Christians, and I'm talking about our crowd, our group, our church, our families, our individual members, we are too much into the world. We're too tied into the world. I'm not telling you to go build a compound somewhere, okay? I'm not saying go stick your head in the sand and don't realize when you got something going on. But some of you are way too tied in to this world. I'm not telling you you got to remove yourself and be some monk somewhere. I know you got to rub shoulders with people. You've got to work. You've got to deal with things. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. There is a balance to the Christian life in being able to be effective and being able to reach people and identify with people without being tainted and spotted by this world. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians are more influenced spiritually emotionally, psychologically with the world than they are with God. You know, there are more people, there are Christians now that are more passionate about liberty and freedom than they are Jesus Christ. They're more worried about losing their freedoms than they are about seeing somebody saved. More worried about losing some freedoms or having something taken away in this great red, red, white, and blue country that we live in than they are about the Bible. More passionate about politics than about Jesus Christ and about the Scriptures. A lot of believers are feeding their minds full of the world's philosophies and ideas and whatever is new. You are Athenian Christians. That's what the Athenians did. They spent their time in nothing else either to hear or to tell some new thing. Just some advice. You can take it. You can put it in one ear and out the other. Listen to as little news as you have to listen to. I know you need to know, you know, if it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> but look. Don't get all tangled up and tied up. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. Now notice what Paul says. So that I might finish my course. You have a path. You have a course laid out. Now the Bible speaks in Ephesians chapter number 2 of the course of this world. There is a course of this world. In other words, if you go to airports and so forth, they call it a concourse. The Bible uses that word, the concourse of the city. You have the broadways. You have the walkways. You have a course that people are walking down and they're going down. The course of this world, all direction is flowing in one direction. And so it's kind of like the stream. You know, you get in the stream and it's flowing in this direction. It's kind of like, you know, the good news, bad news, bad news scenario. Good news, pastor baptized seven in the creek. Bad news, he lost three in the current. <laughs> you know, so, but you know, the current's going in one direction and a dead fish can float down current downstream. But for the Bible believing Christian, we are not supposed to go according to the course of this world. I'm not saying you got to dress like Christians in the, you know, first century. I'm not saying you can't use a gasoline engine. I'm not saying you can't use a microwave oven. I'm not even saying you can't have a TV or a smartphone. But what I'm telling you is there's a danger in allowing the worldliness of this world and the ungodliness of this world to get all over you. And the course and the flow and the thought. You say, what does that carry? It carries a spirit with it. You have Christians now in churches listening to music and they don't even realize because they don't have the discernment that that music actually has a spirit that is ungodly. They don't even have a clue. And so it's the same thing in the world. Ephesians 2, 2, the course of this world. And then the Bible speaks in James chapter 3, verse number 6 about the course of nature. Now think with me for just a second. All the stuff we're seeing in the world, it's just revealing what's already there. It's revealing what's in your heart. It's revealing what's in my heart. You see, when you have tragedy, when you have uh, all kind of the things, you know, the pot's just boiling. It's just ready to boil over. You have all these things set in place for there to be all the stuff that we see going on. And what happens is you have the course of nature. You know, you can have a certain, given the right elements and the right situation... There are evils inside of your heart and in my heart that can explode and come out. 
It's no wonder that people that don't have God, that don't have the Bible, that don't read their Bibles daily, that don't flood their minds and their emotions with the Spirit of God and with the Bible and the Word of God, that don't keep in check their thoughts, their ideas, their opinions. Do you ever ask God if your opinion is His opinion? Well, I'm entitled to my opinion. It's no wonder that people are saying the things and, and doing the things they're doing. It's the course of nature. James 3 verse number 6, when it refers to that, it's talking about the tongue being an unruly member and it sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on the fire of hell. It's no wonder when people get pushed, they push back. When people get stirred up, when people get in a certain situation, it's no wonder they're doing what they're doing. They don't have God. Now, your course began when you got saved, and God wants you as a believer to stay on track. He has all of us in a personal relationship with Him, and the most important thing in your life is your fellowship with Jesus Christ and staying on course, you and Him. Anything that hinders that, anything that gets in the way and blocks that, you need to watch out for. And John the Baptist, you know, the Bible says John fulfilled his course, Acts chapter 13. You know, John had a ministry, and he prophesied, probably didn't even know what he was saying. In John chapter 3, John made this statement, He must increase, Jesus, I must decrease. Of course, you know what happened to him. Herod said, I want that guy's head, and John the Baptist dies. He fulfilled his ministry. He did what God called him to do. He had a plowing ministry. He plowed the way. He worked the ground. He pulled up the stumps. He pulled up the roots. He prepared the way for Christ. He didn't get all the glory. That was his course. That was what he was supposed to do. If you want to be a successful Christian, it is not that you try to mimic and make your life and pattern it after some other Christian's life. Well, I want to be a mother like that mother. I want to be a grandmother like that grandmother. I want to be like that person. I'm not saying you don't have role models and heroes. Everybody has a mentor. But you're not supposed to just be a copycat of your mentor. God has put you on course. God has given you a ministry. God has called you out to live your Christian life. Your course. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in John chapter 17, Jesus made this statement. He said, I have finished the work God gave me to do. You ever think about Jesus Christ? 33 and a half years, and he only had a three and a half year ministry. 30 years go by, and he's just waiting on the right timing. Now, the course commencement, obviously, and you get saved, and you get on course, and Paul mentions running a race, and he uses these types of terms because we are on a course, we are on a path, it is like a race. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, we run that we may obtain. There's an end in mind, and then he also mentions about winning a prize, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. So there's a course, there's a goal, there's rewards at the end. There's a reason we're doing all this. Why are we doing all this? Just so we can be fulfilled? No, I think that's a byproduct of it. I think you experience the peace. You experience, like Paul says here, the joy. You experience some of these things as you're doing your course, but the end of the, the, end of the line is for Jesus Christ. Paul makes this statement. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. We do this because we love Jesus. Now, if you do it because of tradition, or you do it because of religion... You may have some satisfaction and you can check your box and you can feel good about yourself because you lived up to your own expectations. But at the end, are you really going to get a reward just because you came because you wanted to feel good about yourself? There are thousands going to church, or maybe not now yet. Some of them are. Uh, are doing whatever they do religiously so they can feel good about themselves. I feel good when I come to church. That ain't why I come to church. It needs to be about Jesus Christ. Notice this, a specific course. He says, my course. And we ought to feel honored to have a course. Thank God he's given us something to do. You say, well, I don't have anything to do. Yeah, you do. You have a life to live for Jesus. And the Lord puts people in your life that you can be a testimony for. The Lord has given you something to do. All of us. Nobody, we don't believe in Nicolaitanism here. Well, I'm the man of God. I have some water on my shoes. Can you come wash them off? Ricky, come uh, get the water off my shoes, please. Oh, that kind of foolishness. 
touch not God's anointed, all this kind of stuff. I believe I have a responsibility, obviously. I believe you ought to respect the preacher, obviously. There has to be leadership. Anything with two heads is a freak. I get all that. However, all of us are important to God. And God has something for you to do in your life where you are in your life. And He has people in your life that you are to be a testimony, an encouragement, and a minister to. Uh, the Peanuts comic strip, several years, it finally expired, I guess, because the, the old man had passed away and so forth. But uh, it's amazing some of the truth that they, they put forth. There was a conversation between Lucy and Charlie Brown. Of course, you know how that always goes. Lucy is there, and she's got one of these deck chairs, and she's putting out these deck chairs. She, she, she says, life is like a deck chair. Some place it where they can see what's going on. Some place it so they can see where they've been. Some place it so they can see where they are going in the future. And Charlie Brown's over there struggling with his deck chair. He says, I'm still trying to get mine open. <laughs> I can't even get mine unfolded, he says. <laughs> but you know, the Lord has got something for you to do. Don't go through life without realizing that you have a course to run. First Corinthians chapter 3, I'll read to you real quick. Paul says this, One saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. God has given a commencement, a starting place for your course. And let's keep the main thing the main thing. So preacher, I can't believe you're not giving your opinion on everything that's going on. I'm a preacher. I know all the other preachers are taking 30 and 40 minutes and talking about all the stuff that's going on in the world because they've been filling their minds from newspaper articles and, and getting the research so they can be the, you know, that's, it's really Gnosticism is what it is. I really have the secrets. I've discovered all the... Un no, you don't even know the half of what's going on. If you did, you'd probably faint because you'd be so scared you wouldn't be able to keep your britches on. Amen. We are to stay focused on Jesus Christ. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Look, I like my liberties and my freedoms, but I'm a Bible-believing Christian. First. I'm an American second. Like I said, some of you, you know, you're more passionate about your freedoms and you're more passionate about this country than you are your Christianity. Country or Christianity? Which, which would you take first? Now, let's look at some course crashers. Take a... Uh, back up a little bit from the text in which we are and we'll look at three course crashers in other words these are things that will knock you off course and you see them here pretty clear and Paul mentions in his ministry in verse number 19 he says serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears Paul said with many tears he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears it, it grieved him. It bothered him. When Paul went through life, we're not talking about tears because he's necessarily in pain, although Paul did have physical pain. We're talking about tears of anguish. You know, the Bible speaks in the book of Revelation about all sorrow being wiped away. It mentions all pain being taken away. And so when he mentions all tears being wiped away, it's not just tears that come from pain. There are tears that come from emotions. You know, one good sign that we're not animals is the fact that we laugh and we cry. The fact that you can look at a sunset and say that's beautiful. How can, there even, how can you even experience beauty and emotions and pain and sorrow and grief and anguish if you're not a living soul? And so Paul went through this and the trouble and the tears is a real course crasher. You can go through sorrow and grief so much so that you get so blurry-eyed. In other words, you're just looking through those tears, and by looking through those tears, everything's not clear. And so therefore, you need sometimes a preacher to say something or another Christian to say something or read the Bible and have a verse straighten you out. Why do you come to church to get straightened out? You know, it's like the old man never came to church, you know. And they, uh, when he died, all the family wanted him to come. They wanted to have a funeral in the church. They're like, why do you want to have a funeral in the church? He never came here. Why don't you have it down at the bar? You know, that's where he went all the time. 
But then they said, well, come to, bring him to church because now he's straightened out. You know, they got him all straightened out. That's a bad joke. He's straightened out now, but that's not in the good way. But you come to church to get straightened out. We all need to be yanked back into reality. I'm talking about spiritual reality. But those tears, man, sometimes they can get in the, they can get in the way. I can't control my emotions. Oh, really? We'll probably do a whole series on that. Jesus said, the words I speak into you, they are spirit, they are life. What you feed through the eye gate, what you feed through the ear gate, that carries spirits. And you can get the Holy Spirit to feed you through this, or you can feed and stir your emotions through things of the world. But those tears, Paul mentions in Philippians chapter 3, he says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Tears can knock you out of the race. Sorrow. You know, there's been a lot of people that have gotten hurt in church. Amen. There's a lot of preachers. And I'm telling you what, I have heard stories, not just personal stories, which I have of preachers that I know, but I've uh, read books and articles of people even in different denominations. Even, especially in the denominations that I think do things wrong. In other words, where they have a board-controlled church. They basically hire the preacher. And I've read story after story, and the pastor actually thinks this is the way you ought to do things. So he comes in, he pours his life, his family pour their life in, and then they show up, and the next day they, they show up, and they just, they're voted out overnight, just like that. All kind of things. And preachers get hurt. Church members get hurt. Somebody says something, or they don't say something, or they don't include you, or they don't invite you, or, or people get their feelings hurt. And it puts them out. Verse number 19, notice another crasher. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind with many tears. And then he says temptations. Of course, temptations is used two ways in the Bible. One is temptation to sin. Another is temptation as far as a test is concerned. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to be tempted to sin... That's obvious. This flesh will be tempted to sin. God's not going to tempt you to sin. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The devil will tempt you to sin. This world will allure you and tempt you to sin. The news says, turn me on, turn me on. You got to see what's going on. Social media and all that stuff. Look at me, look at my back door. Find out and spy on them. See what they're saying. See what you can find out about them. Don't you like to hear gossip? No, I don't like to hear gossip. I just stay on my, on, my, on my Facebook. Yeah, you're just gossiping. You're just checking in everybody's back door. You want to hear what they're saying about you or whatever. I'm telling you, folks, that stuff is wickedness. And what you have is a situation now where people are being brought in to temptation not only to sin, but on top of that, the trials of life haven't stopped. So everything is kind of doubled up on us now. We have all this pressure from the world, but then we have the trials of life. You know, people are still having surgeries for things other than just the coronavirus. <laughs> life goes on. There's still other sicknesses. There's other troubles. You're still going to have troubles and trials. The car is still going to break down. Other things are going to happen. And Paul had to deal with that. Temptations which befell me by laying in way of the Jews. This specifically dealt with persecution that came. Because we have enjoyed in America, and thank God for it, the past several hundred years, it's really an anomaly in church history. You say, what is that? Freedom to preach the gospel without persecution. And so once that begins to happen, as far as later on down the road, which I'm sure it will, I mean, it's taken place in Europe, and as goes Europe, so goes the United States. And so uh, it happened to Paul, it happened to the apostles, it's going to happen to us, the trials. The fact that when you name the name of Christ, it's going to cost you. Some people, like the Thessalonians, Paul was worried about them. He says, man, 
First Thessalonians chapter number three says, "I'm writing unto you because I was I was worried that the uh, you will basically you know quit because of the the afflictions that you have to endure." It's one thing to say, "Okay, now you're a member of the of our church and praise the Lord and we can fellowship," but just know that there's people watching you when you walk in here. You might lose your job. Now, let's just be honest. If you really thought there was a 90%, let's just say 75%, you'd lose your job because you came to church this morning, would you be here? Let's just ramp it up and say 95%. Let's just say there was a 15% chance. You know, some people can't come or they won't come. I understand the reasons, but they're really frightened they may catch a germ. Let's say there was a 15% chance that you would be killed because you came to church. Now, we're talking about Christians throughout all history. It was a rough time. And, you know, as Laodicean Christians, we're, we're very soft. I'm not saying these things to try to get on you and be mean to you. I'm just telling you, and I'm including myself, I'm very soft. Very easy. We're, we're used to things being easy. But really where I want to look at when Paul moves through this, he mentions not just the persecutions, which he can get, but he's getting ready to step into the den of lions because they have already told him through the Holy Spirit, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. So now he has not just tears, not just temptation, now he has terrors. Verses 22 and 23 says, look, they're telling me I don't need to go, that I'm going to be locked up and more than likely die. Trepidation. Apprehension of the future. You know, that puts a lot of people out. They quit. They say, what's the, what's the use? Somebody said obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off the goal. And a lot of Christians, what they do is they begin to look at the, the fears. If we sat here collectively and we went around and said, okay, let's, let's come up with all the scenarios of what could go wrong for you today. As you walk out the door, you very, it's a very good chance you could slip and fall. And if we began to all talk and come up with things, you know, there's something that could go wrong in your automobile and you could have a tire go out and you could go off the road and all these kind of things and we could begin to, to multiply and talk about these different fears, things that could happen to you. And if more than more that we talked about it, the more and more anxiety you might feel. But look what Paul said in verse 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. How do we complete the course? Here's what we do. Just a few things and we're done. Number one, we have to stand firmly. None of these things move me, he says. You've got to make up your mind as a Christian, you're going to stay on course. That runner, is, as he or she is running on that course, they've realized they're in their lane. They've got to stay on course. They can't be distracted. I've read case after case of runners where they've looked behind them and they've either, either fallen or they've gotten off pace. <coughs> Something has happened because they took their eyes off of the goal, staying focused. I know the football players, they say that because their vocabulary is not very high, but they always say, you know, number one, number one. They say, well, we had to stay focused. We had to stay focused. And, you know, I get that. But that's really true. You got to stay focused. You know, they get ready for the game, you know, they're not sitting there talking about everything that's going on, you know. And it's amazing, Christians, when they get together, all they can talk about is everything going on in the news, everything going on in society. We are so ingrained and tied into society. How come we can't be focused on the Lord? None of these things move me, he says. You've got to stand firmly. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, he says it over and over and over. Having done all these things, he says, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. He goes through that whole thing. He says, stand, stand, withstand. We are to get in our position and stay there. Stay focused. So, well, you know, nothing's going to knock me out of the race. Oh, the devil's got a trick for every single one of us. 
When somebody falls out of the race, don't be pointing your finger. I can't believe they quit. I can't believe they're not serving the Lord anymore. They used to be so faithful. What happened to them? Well, that could be you. Don't be so high and mighty. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, Galatians 6, ye that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If it was not for the grace of God, we would have fallen out of the race. Sometimes I hear preachers that quit and they get their feelings hurt or they have things go on. I think, you know what? Man, if I had a whole, a whole church full of people like they had, I probably would have quit too. Can you imagine getting done with church and having about 15 phone calls of people wanting to argue with you about what you taught and preached? Dealing with that stuff every Sunday? Can you imagine stuff like that? Or somebody always going against every decision you make and always bucking against things. Or somebody always running their mouth about stuff like that. I can't imagine that. I have been so blessed. I'll brag on Calvary Baptist Church for a minute. I have been so blessed as a pastor to have good people to shepherd. Don't make it easy. Amen. You can amen yourself. Give yourself a pat on the back. So when I hear of something happening, the best thing to do is to say, you know what, I don't know what I would do. So, well, if it was me, well, you're saying if it was me from your perspective. Let's say you had the health problems they had. Let's say you had the husband they had, <laughs> the wife they had, the kids they had, the upbringing they had. Let's say you had the job they had. See, we don't want to put ourselves completely in their position. We want to stay in our comfort zone and then be a Monday morning quarterback. It's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. We need to stand firmly. None of these things move me. We need to make up our mind and remind ourselves if it were not for the grace of God, we could be out of the race. And the devil wants you to be all focused. The devil wants you to be all tuned into everything that's going on. He wants you to get more social media accounts so you can be more connected. So you can be engaged. That's the word, right? I want to be engaged and connected. And so I can know what's going on. And everybody can know me and I can know them. And I can build a tower that reaches unto heaven. Now nothing will be imagined which we can do. Anything happens all over the world, I can know it instantly. Something's not good with that because the Lord stopped that. Stand firmly, count correctly. Say, preacher, I'm, I'm a mathematician. Trigonometry, algebra, calculus. Paul says, neither count I my left ear to myself. Here's how you need to count correctly. You need to count correctly as you regard your life and your own self. Philippians chapter number 3, Paul talks about apprehending and he talks about counting. And James chapter number 1, count it all joy. There's all kind of verses on this. Paul talks about reckon yourselves dead and deemed unto sin. How do you count? How do you add things up? Do you add things up with me first? Paul says, neither count I my life dear unto myself. What is dear to you? Dearly beloved, we are gathered together. I used to think as a little kid, you know, dear was just how you started a letter, you know, dear so-and-so, you know. Dear Mr. Bully. Why would you say dear bully if he's the guy that beats you up and gets your lunch money? <laughs> he's not dear. <laughs> but dear is uh, a term of endearment, right? What is dear to you? Paul says many times about the people that he wrote to and the people he preached to, that he loved them, that he prayed for them, that he would... Even the Jews that were wanting to kill him, he said he could wish himself accursed from Christ. He said, I would go to hell for them. Now, I, I can't say that about anybody. But Paul made that statement in Romans chapter number 9. He never put himself in that category of deer. The problem is you don't count correctly. If you don't count correctly, then you're not going to finish your course because the only way to finish your course, although that course is an individual course and there is some self involved in that, but that course is all about Jesus Christ laying that course out for you and doing what Jesus Christ wants you to do. Therefore, you have to count correctly and not put yourself as being dear. And Jesus Christ has got to be dear first. 
and somebody else and others after that. My life, people use that all the time. It's my life. What are you going to tell me to do with my life? Yeah, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says you're going to do with your life. What is your life? It is even as a vapor. Paul says your life is hid with Christ in God. He says you're dead. Dead people don't have a say-so. Well, you know, this is my life, and this is where I want to go to church, and this is what Bible version I want to read. You need to read the Bible version God wants you to read. You need to go to the church God wants you to go to. You need to marry the person God wants you to marry. You need to do the things as far as your career how God wants you to do it. You need to spend your money how God wants you to spend your money. My money, my life, my house, my family. That's God's. Your parents in here, you're stewards, you're entrusted with raising God's children. That's kind of good in a sense because you realize it takes the pressure off. All you have to do is just fulfill your responsibilities and obligations, and then it's not on you anymore. You do what you're supposed to do, and it belongs to Him. It's the course He's laid out. We don't get to choose a lot of things in our course. It's amazing how... Full of pride man is. Men actually think, we actually think we do more than we do, I think. Well, I've just always been healthy. Yeah, because of what? Because God blessed you with good health. I'm not going to eulogize Miss Sue again, but as we talked about her yesterday, her entire life was, made, was met with health difficulties. What did she do? Sit around and gripe and complain all the time? No. She wanted to help others. She wanted to talk about others and pray for others. She'd call and say, is there anybody I need to add to the prayer list? She'd be praying for somebody and they'd already be taken off the list. And I'd have to remind her, no, we took them off the list because she wasn't able to come on Wednesday nights. So I would have to update her on the prayer list. She would get the prayer list and pray over and think about other people, not her. She had enough problems to be thinking about. Yet what we do in our life, we think it's all about us and our life is dear. Your life belongs to Jesus Christ. We need to stand firmly. We need to count correctly. We need to serve selflessly. And finally, I'll give you this verse and we'll be done. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul makes a statement before he dies. This is after the second imprisonment. 2 Timothy is the last letter he writes. He says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He finished his course. He did what God led him to do. That's, that's what a successful Christian life is. God's got you on the path. He's got you on the course. The idea is to finish it. It's been nearly 200 years ago, and there were two Scottish brothers named John and David Livingston. I'm sure you recognize that last name. John had his mind set on making a fortune. And a matter of fact, he did. He became a very wealthy man. And of course, you know the history of David Livingston. David Livingston, of course, you say, well, wasn't he the great explorer? Well, he was a missionary first. But because of his mission exploits, yes, he was a great uh, explorer and discovered all kinds of things in Africa and so forth. David Livingston had knelt and prayed, I will place no value on anything I have or possess unless it is in relationship to the kingdom of God. The inscription over his burial place in Westminster Abbey reads this, For 30 years his life was spent in an unwearied effort to evangelize. On his 59th birthday, David Livingston wrote, My Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I dedicate my whole self to thee. What do we know about John Livingston, his brother? Made all the money? Well, when you, if you find his entry, you'll see in there beside it, John Livingston, brother of David Livingston. What matters? What matters is serving Jesus Christ. That's what matters. The things that get in the way, we need to let go of. There's a, a, fictio, a fictitious story about some men that had uh, escaped in one of these hot air balloons that they were using during the Civil War. And they had gotten over an area over the water, 
and uh, they were in a very dangerous place and they were about to go down so they began to throw stuff out and they finally got to where okay here's food we need food but we don't need to go down into this thing and drown so they threw the food out uh, we need supplies but of course we don't want to go down and drown so they threw the supplies off finally it got to the place that started sinking lower and lower and lower they said okay we'll cut the basket out so they got the ropes and they they you know tied them together where they could just sit on the ropes and they cut the basket off and just in time too they began to float over and they got over where they could finally get to land instead of drowning out in the water out in the sea and the lesson behind that is there are things in your life that you think are necessities but you need to cut those and let them go because they're really pulling you down spiritually so that's the thing about the Christian life it's a positive and negative side you've got to let go of one to be able to grab the other and you say well I'm gonna read more Bible read more Bible read more Bible but you can't do both one of them you're gonna to have to let go of more of the world so you can get a hold of more of Jesus Christ Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Staying on course. Let's bow our heads. Maybe this morning you need to simply say, Lord, I want to stay on course.